please come home to God's love and forgiveness. And so if you have your Bibles with you this morning, uh, and you want to follow along in, in, uh, in your copy, you can turn to Romans chapter 8. And we're going to be looking specifically at verses 37 through 39 this morning. And uh, we'll, we'll be working our way through this, uh, this little passage. And so, if you will, uh, follow along with me as we read, from, read this from God's Word. Uh, this is the Apostle Paul. He's writing to the church at Rome. And he says, no, and we're going to be looking back at, at one of the previous verses here. But he says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that wonderful news? Let's, let's take a moment to pray. Father, we... Thank you for this word, uh, Lord, for truth. Lord, we thank you today for loving us. Lord, help that to become more real to us today. And Lord, help your love for us transform our hearts and our lives and use us for your glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please come home to God's love and forgiveness. Several years ago, a man was driving home into his subdivision. Uh, it was about this time of year, you know, a few days after Thanksgiving, and he had, he had went back to work, and you know, the days are, are shorter, and, and I noticed somebody this week said they, they get up, and it's the, they go to work when it's dark, and they come home when it's dark, and that's the way I feel a lot of times, but, but um, you know, as he was driving into a subdivision, he noticed one of the homes was decorated for Christmas. Now, it seems like every year people get, they do that earlier and earlier, but, but, um, <clears throat> but anyway, and, and he, he, you know, when he, when he drove by, he thought, oh man, you know what? It's about Christmas time, and they've done a wonderful job. You know, all the all the lights had outlined the house, the bushes and the trees in the yard were lit up, and it just looked wonderful. You know, it kind of cheered him up, gave him a good spirit, and a little bit of Christmas joy. And he thought it was great that you know this uh, this family was expressing Christmas in this way and taking time to do that. And, and every night, you know, when he'd drive home from work, he'd drive by that house on his way home, and he would just <coughs> admire it and. And, uh, you know, the closer it got to Christmas, you know, he, 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 he really liked it. And he thought it was awesome. And, uh, but then, you know, uh, Christmas came and went. And, uh, and uh, a week, a, a few days after Christmas, you know, they were still up. They were still on. And, and he thought, well, that's nice. You know, they're keeping the Christmas spirit alive through the new year. And that's, that's good. And so then New Year's Day came. And, and after, and he drove by, and they were still up and on, and and uh, and and then through January, every night, and and each day that he drove home, he he, he you know he would kind of look at it, and he grew a little bit more and more intolerant, I guess, of of the lights, you know, and then and it, and then uh, the end of January came, and into February, the lights were still up, and every night. And when he came home, he'd just get more and more irritated. You know, Valentine's Day came, and they were on on Valentine's Day. And, and he thought to himself, you know, I, I should contact the um, Homeowners Association president and, and tell them that they need to tell them to take those lights down because, you know, it's embarrassing. The whole community, we got covenants and standards to respect and stuff like that, you know. And, and uh, he, he, you know, and, and even into March, you know, it went, and, and the lights are still up, and he thought, you know, if... If they're that lazy that they can't take their lights down, they shouldn't even bother to put them up, right? I mean, you know, and um, he thought, you know, I'm gonna, I, I may just write them an anonymous letter, you know, and, and tell them they need to take those lights down. But then one night toward the end of March, as he drove home, he was glad he didn't write that letter. And he was glad that it, it didn't call the Homeowners Association because as he drove by that house, he saw a new sign in the middle of the yard that said, Welcome home, Jimmy. You see, all that time, the people in that house were waiting on someone they loved to come home. That's what they were waiting on. And, um, you know, did you know that, that God loves you? And 
the reason Jesus was born, the reason we celebrate Christmas, ultimately boils down to this. It was a way for God to make a way for us to come home. To come home to Him. That's what it's all about. And, and you know, some of you today, some of, some people here, maybe, you know, you're, you're far, far away from God. And, uh, you know, you, you're, you just, um, uh, you, you don't even know the way back home, maybe. And, uh, you know, but I want you to know this. Right now, in this Christmas season, God is calling you home. He's calling you to come home to Him. He, he's calling you. You know, a lot of us, we, you know, we, we may be even be Christians. We made a profession of faith. We've been baptized. But, but we're a long way from, from home. We're a long way from God. And God is saying, come home to me. Please come home. Please come home. And uh, please come home for Christmas. You know, and so, so today what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at coming home uh, to to uh, to God's love and forgiveness, and we're going to be, uh, you know, we're going to be looking at these three characteristics of God's compelling love. You know, you can you can come home to God's amazing love. You know, it, it, whoever you are, wherever you are, uh, it doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. It doesn't matter how far away you are. It, it matters not, uh, you know, uh, uh, nothing nothing matters. You know. It, it, God loves you, and His arms are open, the light is on, and He's asking you to come home. He's begging you, He's pleading with you. He longs for you to come home to Him. And so, this morning, I want to show you three characteristics of God's compelling love that we find in this text that hopefully will draw you back home, draw you home to His love and forgiveness. Number one, the first characteristic I want us to notice in this text is that God's love is a conquering love. God's love is a conquering love. Look with me in verse 37, and we see this. In, the, in, in verse 37, he says, no, in all these things, look what he says, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. You see, God's love conquers all powers of evil. Did you know that? God's love is a conquering love. But I don't notice it says in all these things. You see that? In all these things. What things is he talking about? You know, well, if you go back up to verse 35, we're going to look at that. And, and he kind of gives us a little hint. I think he's referring back to this. He says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. And so that's the things he's talking about. And you know, and Paul's speaking from his own experience. It, if you know anything about Paul's life, Paul was persecuted and he was left for dead and he went through all these things. And, and so what he's talking about is, you know, Paul, what we need to understand is Paul and Christ isn't always, uh, isn't always flowers and gumballs, folks. I mean, sometimes... You know, we find ourselves in, in, in terrible situations, but God is always with us. And, and His love is a conquering love, and we need to understand that. So He says, shall tribulation separate me from the love of Christ? And He says, no. You know, that word tribulation, basically it just means trouble. It means trials. And Paul knew about trouble, you know. I mean, uh, he says even all the trials that he faced, they could not separate him from God's love. He says, I've been through distress. See that word distress? And you know what that word distress means? That, that word basically refers to people problems. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Any of y'all got any people in your life that cause you some stress and turmoil? That's what he's talking about. He says, all those people that call, cause me all that distress, all those people problems, he says, look, that cannot separate me from the love of Christ. Those things cannot separate me from God's love. And then... Uh, he says uh, persecution, and we know a little bit about persecution, and, and, and we're seeing that worldwide. That, you know, Paul was a follower of Jesus, and, and just because he followed Jesus, people were after him, and, 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 you know, and he, he was thrown into prison, he was beaten, he was left for dead, and all these things, he was banished. 
And he says, through all this persecution, all those things that happened to me, that could not separate me from the love of Christ. Those things can't separate me from, from the love of Christ. And then he talks about famine. And, and uh, you know, famine, we, we understand what famine is. Most of us haven't experienced it. And, and for a lot of us, it's obvious. But, but, but uh, and Paul went, what? <laughs> okay. I didn't name any names, but you know, um, I resemble that remark. So, uh, but anyway, Paul, when he's talking about famine, he says, you know, he, he went hungry night after night after night, and you know, without food, and 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 um, you know, and then he talks about nakedness. You know, I guess there were times when he didn't have enough adequate clothing to protect himself from the elements and you know and and, and uh, he, you know he says danger he's been exposed to the sword death sentences anyway through all these things Paul said look through all these things none of these things can separate me from the love of God none of these things can separate me from God's love he says even all that I've been through the love of God has never left me. God's love never fails, does it? He always loves us. There's nothing that we go through. There's nothing that we experience. There's nothing that we can do to keep God from loving us. Did you know that? And, that, and that's awesome. And so, now, now notice the promise here. Go back to verse 37 there. Uh, and, and he says, now notice, he says, the promise here, he says, it, it's not from these things. You know, God's love is not to deliver us from these things. You see that? He says, in all these things. In all these things. So a lot of times, you know, we think about how, you know, well, well God's promised to, to deliver us from these things. And there will be a deliverance day, trust me. But for now, today's the day of humiliation. Today's the day of trouble. Today's the day of trials. And God says, even in all these things, he will continue to love us. And so He's with us in all these things. You know, and so God's love is a conquering love. You see that? He says we are more than conquerors. You see that? More than conquerors. Now we know maybe what conquerors are, but, but what does it mean that we're more than conquerors? And I'm going to... I'm going to try to de demonstrate that you, to you a little bit, but but because of God's love and His gift of Jesus and the and the sa saving work of Jesus on the cross and His resurrection, that's why we're more than conquerors. It's because of Jesus and what He's done, and you know because and, and it's hard for us to understand because most of the victories that we win today, uh, you know, they're an event that we uh, participate in and, and we experience that victory. And it comes, and then it's gone, and it's simply remembered after that, you know? And, and so we're conquerors, but it's just in a moment. But, but we're more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. So what does that mean? Well, think about it this way. In 1993, I saw somebody post a question this week about where the high school state championship game was in 1993. Sweetwater played Milan in the state championship. Believe that or not, some of y'all young people, uh, Sweetwater actually won one uh, state championship a few years ago. And I think we got two or three of them, actually. But, but anyway, um, and, but in 1993, I was there, and I wasn't playing. I, I, I went to the game, and, uh, and uh, you know, it was in Nashville at Vanderbilt Stadium, and, and Coach Dupes was the football coach. And, and I remember uh, Coach Stoops told the players before the game that, you know, uh, he said uh, uh, he requested the visiting locker room because he says a winner never comes out of the home locker room here. So, so uh, they got in the visitor's locker room and, you know, and they just made a big deal out of it. And they won 10 to 6 over Milan, which I think is in the Memphis area. And, and, um, and you know, it, it, was, it was fun. And, you know, it was fun in that moment. And, and I think Coy Dalton, he's not here this morning. I'm pretty sure he was on that team. And y'all may know know some folks who were on that team and, and in those years they had some pretty good teams but, but let me ask you something I mean even though we've had a lot of good seasons since then and a lot before then how does that help right now how does that help Sweetwater High School football this season or next season how, how does that what good is a 22 year old state championship today 
What difference does that victory make this year? <laughs> you see, when they play, they don't play in the power of that victory 22 years ago, do they? When they play today, it really has nothing to do with that, you know? No one today really is still celebrating that victory, except for maybe a few who like to live in that moment over and over again, you know? But, but they were conquerors then, but they can't continue to be conquerors over Milan in that way, right? But this text says we are more than conquerors. So how does that relate to us? You see, that, you know, the, the victories we win, just like that football game, you know, uh, we celebrate them. The best day at your workplace or the best year in sales, wherever you work or, or whatever it is, and you win awards or, or bonuses, and the best day you ever had athletically or academically or, or whatever it may be, you know, uh, it, 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 whenever it happens, it's celebrated and it may be commemorated. You know, you may even get a statue outside of the stadium or something in your name, but that moment happened and it's over. But that's not how we celebrate the victory that God's love gives us. Did you know that? That's not how we celebrate that victory. That's not how we celebrate that conquering because over 2,000 years ago, Jesus won the battle over sin, death, and the grave. And you know what? That victory continues <coughs> till today. And it will continue forever. And so we can celebrate. We are more than conquerors because of Him and what He's done. We, cannot, we can celebrate today and tomorrow and next Sunday and every day all through eternity because His victory is still happening and will always be happening forever. Y'all understand that? That's what it means to be more than conquerors. His love and His power... Uh, the, the Holy Spirit continues to give us victory over those things today. And so we can celebrate the victory over these things that Christ has already won. So you can celebrate victories today over your addictions. You can celebrate victories over your depression. You can celebrate victories through your trials and your persecutions and your afflictions and anything else that you experience today, you can celebrate victory in Jesus because of Him we are more than conquerors. Why? Because of His conquering love. That's it. Because He loves us. He loves us. And for that reason, we can celebrate because His love is a conquering love. Please come home this Christmas because God's love is a conquering love. That's number one. Number two, not only is His love a conquering love, but His love is a certain love. It's a certain love. Look with me at verses 38 and 39. Look what He says. He says, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any else, anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. You see that? You see, you can always count on God's love. In verse 35, we saw all these things that Paul experienced, right? And how God's love was conquering through those things. And it was a conquering love. But here... We see him expand a little bit more, and he describes uh, uh, it's a list of ten things, um, that, and he breaks them down. And most of them are in pairs, and 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 uh, he he gets a little poetic with us, I guess, a little bit. So let's look at these things. For, at first, he leads off. He says, "For I'm sure that neither death nor life can what will separate us from the love of God in Christ." You see that death or life. God's love is a certain love. You see, a lot of people fear death. Did you know that? A lot of people they they, they fear death, and and you know because hey, after all, you know death it's final, it's inescapable. A lot of times it comes too soon, it comes painfully, and um, and a lot, a lot of us just fear that. And not only do we fear our own death, a lot of times we fear the death of the people that we love. 
you know, we, we fear the death of people that have already died, people we grieve over, or we're, we're afraid of people that we love that, that may be dying or about to die. And, and a lot of times when we, when we get to thinking about that, we, we get to wondering, does God really love us because of the things we're experiencing, because somebody was taken too young? And, and we say, well, or, or does God really love us? And, uh, but the Bible says that death cannot separate us from the love of God. Did you know that? And so when those things happen, when you're afraid of death, don't be afraid of death because death cannot separate you from God's love. And then he talks about life. You know, life cannot separate us from the love of God. Some people fear life more than death. Did you know that? Last week, unfortunately, we had a young man who was involved in one of our small groups who took his own life. Probably because he feared life. He, was, he feared life. You know, he feared life more than death. And, and for some of you, you know, I mean, the pain of living each day makes you wonder if God really loves you. You know, a lot of people are living that way. Their lives are so messed up or they feel like they're so messed up and they're so terrible they, they, or they think they're so terrible, they wonder if God really loves them. And, 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 and they hate life because they don't understand that even in life, life, cannot separate us from the love of God. Oh, how He loves us. Oh, how He loves us. Let's not forget that. And so, then He, he not only talks about death and life, and that He talks about angels and rulers. You see that? Angels and rulers. And so we see angels, and it might make us wonder, well, you know, uh, why would angels separate us from from God. Well, you know, a lot of people worship angels, you know, and, and if you worship something other than God, it can separate you from God. But, but let's look at it in its pairing. He says angels and rulers and, and um, the word rulers, a lot of times Paul used that word um, to, dis, to uh, refer to demonic spirits. And so I think that's what he's doing here. He's, he's giving us that contrast of the angels of God and the demonic spirits. Uh, that, that are in that spiritual world. So here he's including both sides and he, he's referring to those spiritual battles that take place behind the scenes where angels are battling these demonic forces and all these things are always going on around us. And, and, and what we need to understand is this. God's angels will not separate us from His great love. And, and the demonic forces of hell cannot separate us. From God's love. Y'all understand that? And so that's why he's telling us angels and demons, they cannot separate us and they will not separate us from God's love. And then he says, nor things present nor things to come. And so he's talking about tense here. He's talking about present and he's talking about future. And so a lot of times, you know, it's 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 the, the things to come. It's the fear of tomorrow that, that we're afraid of, you know, and and, uh, you know, it may be today in our, in our world, maybe it's the fear of terrorism and what's going to take place in our country with, with ISIS and, and, and those things that, that are, look like they're coming our way. It makes us wonder a lot of times because our futures look so dim, our world looks like it's falling apart and, 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 and it looks like it's, it's bad and it's only going to get worse in and, and, and the future. And so it makes us wonder, does God really love us? Does He really love us? And, but what we've got to understand is there's nothing in the present now that you're going through and there's nothing that's going to happen in the future that can ever separate you from the love of God. Amen? That's good news to know that, folks. And then he refers to powers. You see that the last word in verse 38? And, and this, the, for powers, this word, a lot of times it refers to miracles or, or any kind of mighty work and and sometimes it refers to a person in power or some type of authority. And, but, and here, but here's the truth that we need to understand. No miracle or mighty act or any person in power can ever in any way, guess what, separate you from the love of God. Never. Not a president. Not a principal. Not a parent. Not a priest. Not a pastor. That's just the peace. Right? <laughs> Not a spouse or an atheist. Listen, no powerful person can come in your life and say there is no God. <laughs> or say that God doesn't love you. Because if they do, they're a liar. 
They're a liar. You can't, you can't believe that stuff. It's a lie because nothing, no one, no place, no how can separate you from the love of God. No powerful person can do that to you. So don't, don't let them. And notice in, in verse 30, or let's see, then he talks about height and depth. I almost skipped that one. And so in those days, what he's talking about height and depth is uh, the, the astrology or the astronomers. You know, they look at the stars and what they called the stars that you could see in the sky are the heights. And the stars in the depths were those that had yet to come up. And so you know how they used to, to follow the stars and worship. And so basically I think what he's getting at is this. Look, no constellation, <laughs> no astrological phenomenon, no daily prediction in the paper because of your sign can separate you from the love of God. None of that can separate you from God's love. And, and now, look what he says in, in verse 39. This last little phrase here before we move on, he says, nor anything else in all creation. Now he just gets all inclusive, don't he? I mean, you know, in those days, paper and pen were rare and expensive, and I guess he just didn't feel like naming everything, right? And so, in case you were wondering, you know, in case you were wondering about anything else that he didn't mention that might influence you negatively and take you away from God's love, he makes sure you understand that nothing else in all of creation that you can think of can separate you from God's love. <laughs> That's good news, folks. Now, look back to the beginning of verse 38. Look at those first four words. What does it say? Say it with me. For I am sure. I am sure. <laughs> See that? He's not saying these things probably can't separate you from God's love. I'm 99% sure, you know. No, you know. Yeah. He says, I am certain. God's love is certain. It's as certain as anything that there is. And God's, that kind of love, that kind of certain love, if you know that somebody's going to love you no matter what, it can give you a lot of confidence give you a lot of confidence. And we can know that God loves us like that. In the 5th century, there was a man who lived in Syria. And uh, he was known as the greatest preacher alive in his day. You know, uh, quite a bit of difference today in, in Syria, by the way. In the 5th century, uh, Syria was a Christian hub. It was known as a, a place of the gospel, a place for preaching. And uh, But today, not quite like that. And, but uh, Antioch was in Syria. And you've heard of Antioch. Was, and they were first called Christians in Antioch, right? And, and so, but the, this man in Antioch in the 5th century, in the, in the 400s, his name was John of Antioch. And he was also known as John Chrysostom. Chris, Chrysostom, is that right? Yeah, okay. I'm afraid I can say that wrong. I don't say that word a whole lot. But anyway, so I'll probably just call him John from now on. But, but he had this nickname, Golden Mouth, because he was... And that's a weird nickname, isn't it? But, but uh, if y'all want to call me that, that's fine. But, but, uh, <laughs> but he was a great preacher. And, he, you know, he didn't give himself that name. But, uh, you know, it, it just became a name that people, uh, people called him because I guess he was just this great orator. And, and uh, he, was, he, he was persecuted because of his Christian faith. And, and he was brought before the Roman emperor. And uh, the Roman emperor threatened to banish him because of, of his faith. He says, you know, Basically, you know, you can't preach here anymore and you can't preach about Christ especially and, and so I'm going to banish you. And, and Chrysostom, Chrysostom, John, <laughs> said, you cannot banish me, he said, because the whole world is my father's house. And the emperor says, okay, so, well, I'll kill you. And, and John C. said, uh, you cannot kill me because my life is hidden in Christ with God. <laughs> and so he says, you, you can't take my life from me. And so the emperor says, well, I'll take away all your treasures. And John C. 
So he says, well, you can't do that either because all my treasure is in heaven. <laughs> and so the emperor then says, well, I'll tell you what. He says, he says, I'll drive you away from everyone that you know so you'll have no friend left. And John C. says, you can't do that because I have a friend in heaven that you can never separate me from. And then that, then that man, John Chrysostom, John of Antioch, old gold mouth, he looked the emperor in the eye and said, I defy you. There's nothing you can do to harm me. The boldness, the courage, the faith. Where did that come from? Where did that come from? How was he able to respond in that way? I'll tell you how he was able to respond that way. Why he was able to respond that way. Because he was certain. He was sure of God's great love for him. He was sure of it. And, and listen, let me tell you something. When you become certain that God loves you, when you get that confidence and you know that you're in that relationship with Him and you're having fellowship with the Father, when you become certain that God's love you, you can face your enemies. You can defy your enemies. <laughs> ISIS will not terrify you. Any terrorist cannot harm you. You can face your enemy and defy them when you're sure that you can always count on God's love. Have you come to that place in your life where you know that you know God loves you? Are you there? And you know, there, there have been times in my life when I've questioned God's love. You know, I just want to be honest with you and open with you about this. I mean, there, there have been times when I've been like that and I've questioned God's love when certain things have happened in my life and things got tough and I wondered if God really loved me because, you know, bad things were happening or seemingly bad things were happening. And, and you know, but let, let me tell you something. All the time, God's love was still there. He always loved me. He never left me. He always loved me. We may not feel confident. We may not feel victorious sometimes. You know, and we may wonder, does God really love me? Does God really love me? Well, I want you to do this. When you start feeling like that, when you start thinking like that, and you start wondering, does God really love me? I want you to read these verses. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Memorize that and, and throw it in Satan's face. Nothing can separate you from God's love. Remember that. Because the evil one, he wants you to think that God don't love you. He wants you to be miserable in the circumstances of them, in, in this life when you ought to know if you're a child of God, you're blessed and highly favored. And you've got a future that's out of this world. Amen? And so we ought to remember that. God loves us. And listen, another thing that, that you need to do is don't try to deal with these things on your own. Go to somebody that you love, that knows that, not, that that person that you know that loves God, and share your struggles with them. And I'll guarantee you, when you share your struggles with them, they're gonna have a similar struggle that they can share with you. We all go through these things. Don't keep those things to yourself. That's one of the things. That's the reason we try to emphasize this authentic community. Don't be trying to hide that stuff and carry it all alone. It'll break you and tear you down. When you start feeling that way, you need to be around God's people who will love you and help you. You don't need to try to hide those things. Let somebody know. And if you don't know who to talk to, uh, you know, don't withdraw. Come and talk to someone on a leadership team. Come to me. We'll pray with you. We'll help you. That's why we're here. We want to help you. Because we've been through those things. And a lot of times we're going through them too. And, but here's the thing. You should come home to God this Christmas because God's love is a conquering love. And God's love is a certain love. One more thing I want to share with you. One more characteristic, and this, this, will, kind of, this will wrap it up. His love is a costly love. 
And when we look at that last part of verse 39, we see this. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The love of God in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, God, God's love is costly because He sacrificed His own Son for us. He paid the ultimate sacrifice. He gave His life. He lived His life for us and He died for us. He lived a perfect life in our place. He died taking our sin in our place. This is the perfect and fullest expression of God's love. No greater love has any man than he who lays down his life for his friends. And that's what Jesus did for us. Jesus Christ defeated Satan and death on the cross and He shows us this Great love of God. He demonstrated that through us, uh, or through the cross. And that love that He gave us, this demonstration that He gave us on the cross of Calvary, it's a permanent love. And it's irrevocable. <laughs> it's forever. It's the perfect, you see, the perfect demonstration of God's love is not your family. As great as your family may be, and as much as you love them, and, and as much as you like to spend time with them and all those things, they are not the greatest expression of God's love. You know, they're, they're just not. And it's not in creation. A lot of times we, we see the mountains and the beach and all these things and we say, oh, it's so beautiful. It's a perfect expression of God's love. No, not, not quite. It's an, it's an expression of God's love, but it's not the perfect expression of God's love. Or your friends, the friends you love, whatever. You see, Jesus Christ is the perfect expression of God's love. His life, His sacrifice. When we, we see the cost of God's love at Christmas, you see, every other baby born in this world was born to live. But Jesus was born to die for you and me. He was born to die for you and me. He came as a baby. He grew into a man to die. To die for us. The reason He died was to show God's great love for you and to rescue you and me from sin. In 1 John chapter 4, uh, we see this. It says, In this the love of God was made manifest. It was revealed to us that God sent His only Son into the world so we might live through Him. And this is love. Not that we've loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for my sins. You see, Jesus loves you so much. He loves you. He came into the world to die for you. That's the costly love. It's a costly love. That's real love. In one of his short stories, Ernest Hemingway tells the story of a young man named Paco in Madrid, Spain. Paco had run away from home. And, uh, you know, his father was heartbroken. You know, he, he, uh, he searched everywhere and he, he couldn't find the young Paco. He, he looked everywhere he knew. And in an act of desperation, he took what little money he had and, and he took out an ad in the paper. And um, it was a small ad, but it was all he could afford. And he placed this ad. He said, Paco, it was like in the personal section, Paco, meet me at the Hotel Montana noon Tuesday. That's all it said. So Tuesday morning came. Oh, oh excuse me. There's one other line that says, All is forgiven, Papa. Meet, um, Paco, meet me at Hotel Montana to, noon Tuesday. All is forgiven. Love, Papa. So Tuesday came. He showed up at the hotel. When he got there, he found 800 young men, all named Paco. <laughs> all had seen the ad. All longing to hear three words from their father. All is forgiven. See, you have a father who wants you to come home. And 
Through the blood of Christ, He's expressed His perfect love for you. Every sin you've ever committed or will commit was paid for on that cross. He loves you. He paid the price for your sins. His plea to you is to please come home for Christmas. Please come home to His great love. He loves you. It doesn't matter what you've done or who you've done it with. It doesn't matter where you've been or, 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 or where, you, where you've gone. You know, it, it, none of those things matter. He wants you to turn away from your sin and come back to Him. That's what He wants. Please come home for Christmas. So I want to ask you this morning, what keeps you from coming home today? What keeps you from coming home to Him? There shouldn't be any reason. There shouldn't be any reason at all. So right now as we begin to sing, let's all stand together. Will you just take that first step right now? His arms are open wide and He's ready to...